So that is my introduction. And now I want to switch and introduce our first speaker for this morning, which is Deidre McCarthy from the National Park Service. I've already been warned this morning, I have to hit F5, all right, in order to make this work. There it goes, all right. <laughs> uh, so as has already been introduced, uh, I, I work with the National Park Service. I work in the cultural resource GIS facility of the National Park Service. Uh, that uh, is the only office within the Park Service that is solely dedicated to applying GIS and GPS technology to cultural resources. So we're in sort of a rather unique position to be able to apply these technologies based on the knowledge that we have, the knowledge base that we have in terms of dealing with historic preservation uh, and how to apply these kinds of technologies to cultural resource management. Uh, so we do work inside the Park Service. We work outside the Park Service. We work with many of the partners uh, that make up the, the network of historic preservation professionals here in the United States. So here in the United States, uh, we do have a regulatory need to have cultural resource spatial data, uh, which is, is helpful. Uh, it would be great if we actually could take advantage of that regulatory need to build a better uh, spatial data set for cultural resources. Uh, but most importantly, uh, from the various different laws that we have, uh, the, the highest priority one for, from, our, from my perspective is the National Historic Preservation Act, which creates uh, a section within it uh, that defines uh, that, that federal government's agencies uh, need to, when they respond to any sort of disaster or anything like that, they need to first look to see, are there historic resources that might be impacted how might they be impacted and what would they do in order to mitigate that impact? That's referred to as Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So that's, that sort of sets the stage for how the federal agencies respond and how we, how we become involved in any sort of disaster response. But here we also need to, to deal with the the disconnected and, and uh, dispersed uh, cultural resource communities that we, that we have to work with. Every state has a state historic preservation office. Tribes have tribal historic preservation offices. Uh, every one of these various different agencies, state, local, federal, they are all keeping their own inventories of cultural resources. Um, these inventories form the pool of what what gets nominated and put on the National Register of Historic Places. The Park Service keeps that National Register of Historic Places. There are over 90,000 resources listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but there are also 15,000 districts, at least historic districts, and within those districts lie another million properties. So combining all of these various different inventories together, we have about five million or more uh, resources on various different inventories. They're just not all connected. So when there is a disaster, there's gonna be problems in terms of having to pull all of that information together. In addition, most of those states and those tribes and those federal agencies keep those inventories in different capacities. They all start in paper. We've been collecting this information since 1966 when the National Historic Preservation Act was put together. So getting that information out of the paper and into a digital world can be troubling at times and it can certainly be challenging. So when Hurricane Katrina uh, hit the, uh, the Gulf Coast of, of the United States and, and barreled right into uh, Louisiana and Mississippi, it was the single largest disaster for cultural resources that the U.S. has seen since the creation of the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. You can see my stats up here. Uh, over uh, about $108 billion in property damage in 20,005 dollars. Uh, and it spanned about 90,000 square miles across three different states. So uh, I, I thought it was a, a good analogy in, in my paper. You'll see I said that uh, that's about the size of the UK. So it's not a small disaster. Uh, so FEMA, 
the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has to respond to that. And under the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, this was one of their largest Section 106 actions. So again, to be compliant with Section 106, they've got to go out, survey, and evaluate all of those potential demolitions or any undertaking that the government might go through. They've got to consult with the State Historic Preservation Office to develop some kind of agreement as to whether any of those resources are historic. Are they potentially eligible for the National Register? And determine if there is going to be an adverse effect on those resources, what they need to do in order to mitigate this. In order to do any of that, they needed to have accurate locational information for any of those potential undertakings. They needed to understand the extent of the problem. Across three states, you don't just walk in and say, oh, well, sure, it's going to take you know, five weeks and we'll have everything surveyed and we'll be done and we'll move on. It's a big disaster and a large problem to have to deal with. So again, the scope of the problem uh, in terms of disaster terminology, uh, there were about 5,000 red tag structures that were an imminent threat to public health and safety that had to be surveyed. There were about 86,000 uh, yellow tag structures, so those are sort of in the middle. There's major damage, but they could be rehabilitated, they could, they could be dealt with, and about 40,000 green tag structures. So it doesn't matter what color tag you are, you've got to get surveyed and we've got to determine is it historic, is it eligible to, for the National Register, does everybody agree? So uh, FEMA asked for our help uh, to develop a strategy to help them quickly identify and evaluate all of these affected properties to see, again, are they National Register, are they national register eligible? Uh, the Park Service then developed uh, a GPS survey strategy uh, to look at what's been slated for demolition. We used handheld GPS receivers to go out in the field, collect a location for each one of those, properties that we, we get list, lists of from the, the city and various different agencies. We used a detailed data dictionary, a form within that handheld di, di, uh, GPS receiver to start looking at what are the characteristics of these properties? Are they, are they historic? Are they not historic? To look at their condition, to look at their historic integrity, to look at their eligibility. This survey being extremely accurate, this is a GPS receiver with plus or minus th three meters of accuracy which is pretty good 10 years ago. Uh, so that produced a great form of documentation, which is required under Section 106, uh, and a tool, again, to help us determine concurrence with those state historic preservation offices. So again, we talked yesterday a little bit about the need for inventories and how important that is. Well, here's the example of exactly that. Prior to this disaster in Louisiana, the State Historic Preservation Office did have a GIS and it did have some information in, in their inventory. It included 19,000 point locations for cultural resources across the entire state. So if we're looking at just New Orleans, as part of the uh, Section 106 survey that we conducted uh, to help FEMA out, uh, we collected a whole lot more information and we further collected additional information to help mitigate those adverse effects. So in the end, we ended up with about 60,000 point locations just in New Orleans and around New Orleans to add to that existing inventory for the state. So not only does this serve as a tool to help in the immediate response, but it serves to help in terms of preparing for the next disaster. So facilitating all of this, again, was that data dictionary that was inside those GPS receivers. This uh, data dictionary, again, is just sort of a form so that while I'm out in the field, I can ensure that everything is spelled correctly, everything, everybody's picking off of the same menus, how many, how many different ways can I spell shotgun house? Quite a few. Uh, how many times do I want to enter that information? Not that many. Uh, so I want to have lots of menus, I want to be able to use what we have already. So we went to the State Historic Preservation Office and said, okay, you normally use paper survey forms. Let's take those paper survey forms, get them into a digital form so that we can now start using them here. We're gonna go back, talk to FEMA, get their additional information that they need to understand about each one of those resources. We're gonna to talk to the local certified governments and say, what information do you need to have so we can have one form that everybody's using. Again, this is gonna really help the surveyors who go out in the field focus their efforts, 
tell them what they need to be looking at, not to get distracted by whatever else they might be having to work through. Um, and it's going to provide structured data at the end that's going to eliminate a lot of errors in terms of data entry, pulling things from paper and putting into a digital format. So here's how the workflow sort of went for the most part. Uh, FEMA received lists of targeted features, things that would be demolished. Uh, and they sent surveyors into the field to locate those individual uh, properties. The GPS data and the attribute information, that descriptive information, was collected. Uh, we took digital photographs uh, for each property, so you could then pull all of that information into the GIS back at the office. Every day that information was downloaded from the surveyors. Uh, they would go out, take their GPS receiver, bring it back at the end of the day. We pull, up, pull all that information into the GIS. Now we can provide immediately a status update to the agencies that are sending folks out into the field and say, this is what we got accomplished today. This is how many buildings we surveyed. This is where you need to target your survey for tomorrow. Now we're actually able to sit down with the State Historic Preservation Office through the GIS, starting to look at, here's a photograph of the buildings, here's the information we collected sitting out there standing in front of the building. Do we agree? Do we not agree? Is this historic? Is it not historic? Is it eligible? Uh, and now we can develop this concurrence. Immediately we can generate the letters to send out to people that say, all right, this is, this is historic, it's eligible for the National Register. No, this isn't. This is an adverse effect. No, this isn't. It makes the situation much easier to deal with. For treatment measures, uh, again, that sort of mitigation for if there was an adverse effect, FEMA selected a number of historic districts downtown and went through and, provide, and essentially applied the same technology, the same workflow, and the same idea to start to document all of the various different contributing and non-contributing elements within those historic districts. There are many historic districts, some of the oldest historic districts uh, that were designated as National Register eligible exist in New Orleans. You'd think we at the Park Service would keep track of what is contributing and not contributing to those historic districts? It'd be great if we did. Uh, it'd be great if the states did. Sometimes they do. Uh, it would be great if somebody did. Well, in this case, nobody did. Uh, so that was something that Although this was a disaster, and although there were adverse effects, and although there were many issues, this was something that FEMA felt would be important to be able to do. We can mitigate some of these adverse effects by going back, collecting this information for everything that's inside these historic districts, whether it's contributing to that historic district or not contributing, at least next time there's a hurricane, because there will never be another hurricane in the Gulf, right? <laughs> next time there's a hurricane, at least we know what was there. So how did this work uh, in terms of did it work, did it not work? Um, the methods that we, that we applied and the technology that we applied to the situation uh, meant that this whole process, this Section 106 process, was digital for the very first time. And the treatment measures were digital, again, for the very first time. And in fact, being able to document as part of Section 106 by mapping was for the first time available to us. So according to the regulations, under Section 106, you have 90 days to go out, survey, determine if that is eligible and for the National Register and if there's an adverse effect for, 90 days is an immense amount of time in a disaster. That's forever. But we were able through this system to get it down to two weeks instead of 90 days, which meant decisions could move faster, which meant building infrastructure could move faster, which meant everything could move faster. So in terms of long-term cultural resource management, uh, through all of this data that was created and collected, that meant we could give that back to the state at the end. We could give that back to the local governments at the end. Now they have all this information with which to plan, not only for the next disaster, but what are they going to do next week? Who needs a permit? How do, we, how do we apply for other grants? What are we going to do with this kind of information? Well. The Park Service gave a lot of grants following Hurricane Katrina. It gave a lot of grants out to help determine or help fix up a lot, of, a lot of these resources. Well, in order to receive one of those grants, you've got to be eligible for the National Register. I don't know, now we have a giant list of stuff. And we've got all these locations. So now we can bring that information, 
all these little black dots up here are properties that received grants. Now we can pull all of that information together. The state can use that information, the Park Service can use that information, FEMA can use that information. Being able to, use, to collect this information digitally with a standard data type meant that we could now start to share all of this information much easier. With any survey, there are always challenges, as we've all seen. Uh, I thought it, uh, it was very interesting to, uh, to discuss Haiti yesterday uh, and to see that many of the challenges you faced there were exactly the same as what we faced uh, in Katrina. Again, the whole idea of implementing a completely new form uh, or a completely new strategy on how to deal with this in the middle of a disaster is not necessarily the best time to try to do that. Uh, it's a little challenging to try to apply an entirely new strategy in the middle of the chaos that is a disaster. So it was challenging. Um, the need to respond quickly is always critical in a disaster. So we needed to move fast, but the efficiency of dealing with federal agencies talking to state agencies, talking to local agencies, and trying to get them all to coordinate Good luck. That's not easy, especially getting the federal agencies to talk to each other. We again, uh, just, just like uh, was discussed yesterday with Haiti, we had trouble getting equipment. We had trouble getting trained staff. We had trouble uh, with the constant turnover of staff. Other, rather than having the five to 10 day volunteers uh, that were available for Haiti, we had 90 day folks. Okay, 90 days. So every 90 days I, essentially re-explained, here's the strategy, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it every 90 days. And tried to had, to had to justify why we're doing this. And there's also just the mere, how do I get there? There's buildings in the way. With Katrina, we had buildings that maybe floated, I don't know, about seven blocks from each other or from where they were originally buildings in the middle of the streets. How can you figure out, is that the building that used to be over there? One of our best resources was a mailman that we found walking around in the lower ninth ward of, uh, of <laughs> New Orleans. He was great. He knew all the buildings. And he knew that one should be over there. That was very helpful. But one of the things that we did find is that as we were going out and doing this survey, about seven different federal agencies or state agencies had looked at and evaluated each one of these buildings. They just weren't talking to each other, they weren't taking locations, and they weren't sharing data with each other. That made things very challenging. So here's some lessons that we learned. Uh, with disaster preparedness, that really needs to be the priority. Having accurate and up-to-date information, having that digital inventory is absolutely critical. And there's a need to sort of put together that infrastructure and the workflow so that we can operate in any disaster using the same kind of situation and have that workflow ready to go so that when the disaster hits, you know what you need to do. So again, we talked to yesterday, there's a need to communicate and a need to share data that is absolutely critical. There's always gonna be a need to be able to get to that information and to be able to share it so that other people can understand, immediately use it in appropriate ways for what they're trying to do. So there's a need to establish data sharing agreements. We found that to be one of the biggest problems. Who owns the data? Who gets the data in the end? If we set up data sharing agreements ahead of time, that would certainly help deal with that situation. The security of the information. This is cultural resource data. We don't want to publicize it to the to everybody under the sun necessarily. That was mentioned yesterday too, the idea of having the need to secure the information. Uh, again, there's a need to have personnel uh, available to you that are familiar both with the technology but the cultural resource side of things. There needs to be that nexus where people can understand both. The documentation, I always come back to this, you're gonna lose stuff, it's a disaster. You cannot save everything. The documentation is the only way whether it's a traditional documentation or a digital documentation, that it's the only way to guarantee the preservation of that thing, whatever it is, to document it. So it was, uh, the strategy was very successful uh, and it did uh, receive some awards uh, from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation uh, following the disaster. Uh, we did 
have some success in bringing this idea of the need for cultural resource inventories uh, to the Preserve America uh, initiative, which followed on all of this. Uh, unfortunately, and we even got it into the budget. Yes, the budget, the, the budget. We even got it in as a line item, but of course that disappeared. Uh, so we, we did have some success, uh, but it's, it's, as I said yesterday, creating, creating that baseline documentation is not sexy. Nobody, nobody wants to fund that. So 10 years later, we can look back at this uh, and we can see, and, and I mentioned this yesterday, the state of the technology has changed entirely. Now we have many, many, many more tools that are available to us. 10 years ago, Google Earth didn't exist. Think about that. When you get on and you Google something to figure out where you are, you're using Google Earth, that didn't exist. You know what would have been super helpful for us? Having that, having that street view. <laughs> That's like a surveyor's dream, the street view. <laughs> we, don't have, we didn't have that then. Uh, tablets, to be able to go out and survey with tablets, to be able to take advantage of these technologies that are out there, LIDAR, drones, all of these kinds of things, to have web-based GIS. It didn't exist at the time. That was one of our most critical problems. We needed to be able to share that GIS data between the state and FEMA. It would have been great if we'd have had a web-based GIS so that we could have done that remotely instead of having somebody from the State Historic Preservation Office actually stationed in the office with FEMA. It would have been very helpful for everybody. Now we can do that, we couldn't at the time. So it has helped. And we did take our, take our lessons learned and take our methodology and we did produce a document that did describe all of this. Uh, which you can download from our webpage and, and use. Uh, it has all, it contains all of our data dictionaries, all of our tools, all of our workflow diagrams. It's all there uh, and you're more than welcome to uh, take a look at that and download to your heart's content. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them, but I think we're going to follow the protocol that we used yesterday and I'm just going to I'm just going to invite my discussant up here, uh, John Ketchum from uh, FEMA, uh, who worked very closely with us on this. Uh, and so John can uh, answer and some questions and discuss with us. I, I understand the comical nature of how this looks. <laughs> I wish there were a box, uh, but I'm not going to sit in the hot seat. Susan, first of all, I just want to thank you for your keen observations. Um, I also learned that Valparaiso is not just in Indiana, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, this is for me uh, going back 10 years and bringing back many memories, uh, most of them positive. Um, I would just maybe observe first, for those of you who think that one person cannot make a difference in a post-disaster environment, to my right proves that that is absolutely incorrect. Uh, Deidre was gracious enough to use the first person plural in her presentation. So much of that was she. And I would just emphasize that what she described occurred over a few short months. The paradox in New Orleans was that city government, and in many respects, state government was on its knees. And with that, we had the opportunity to use that period to develop a historic preservation review strategy, including, and I think perhaps the central tenet being our approach to documentation of historic properties, a Herculean task. I mean, you think about it, creating that strategy, uh, developing the data dictionary, no small task in and of itself, then procuring the necessary technology, training FEMA and state staff to use that technology appropriately, and then ensuring that we, when we went out into the field that we actually were approaching our documentation responsibilities correctly. That occurred between September of 2005 and early spring of 2006. As a result, Remember that slide that Deidre showed you with the red, yellow, and green tag buildings? It was those yellow tag buildings, those 86 
thousand buildings that we were most concerned about that would be demolished. Because of Deidre's work, ultimately less than 6,000 properties were demolished in the city of New Orleans. Of those, roughly 1,000 were historic. That in and of itself, I think, represents one of the unsung successful legacies of the federal response, working with our state and local partners. Now, having said that, over to the east in Mississippi, we had a much more mixed legacy. Frankly, local government was much better poised to move forward with demolition activities after Katrina and proceeded accordingly. And it was very difficult for us to catch up. So you compare, juxtapose Mississippi and Louisiana, perhaps uh, very different results and a cautionary tale in Mississippi on how not to approach our responsibilities. The other observation, and I think Deidre touched upon this both in her presentation and her paper, is how to ensure that we are not being redundant in our documentation efforts. Uh, one of the challenges that I faced was ensuring that we were able to take advantage of all the many offers of assistance that came from national, regional, and local organizations and agencies. That was a struggle at times. And Deidre, I, I don't know, you know, here we are a decade uh, from Katrina. We had the events in South Carolina over the past week. Uh, flooding perhaps continuing over the next several weeks. How, looking forward, do you think we can ensure that we are taking advantage of all those very enthusiastic and well-meaning offers of assistance and channel them to create a, a more uh, systematic approach to documentation? Is, are there some strategies there? I, I think there are. Uh, I know for those of you who are used to GIS and, and used to looking at digital data, the idea of crowdsourcing uh, makes you unhappy. It makes me unhappy. But this is an example, I think, where crowdsourcing of data is, is something that can be taken advantage of, where you have a pool of volunteers like we had with New Orleans, and I'm sure will come with Charleston, uh, people that are knowledgeable people that understand the resources, people that understand the cultural resources. The tools now that we have, the technological tools are much more intuitive, much easier for people to use. I can go out with my tablet and I can collect that information and we can take advantage of using that knowledge base uh, in, a, in a much more cohesive way. And I think that's something that we didn't have with Katrina that we could certainly take advantage of now. And again, we have standards for our data, we have standards for those various different applications for data collectors for things like that it's much more intuitive and accessible you know if i have a cell phone i can go out and collect data do do you feel you alluded to how over the past 10 years our friends at google have have perhaps demystified uh, digital documentation do, do you feel there are ways that the public could better contribute to the post-disaster decision-making and even pre-disaster decision-making in a GIS context? Are, are there things the public could do? I, I do think so. <laughs> uh, when you have something like Google, again, which is so intuitive, which everybody uses, you know, what, now Google is a verb. I'm gonna go and Google my whatever. You know, you can take advantage of the fact that Google now even has uh, historic imagery and things like that, mm -hmm. so I can, as the public, uh, I can look at that imagery, I can do it from the safety of my own home, and I can look at those street views, and, and I can understand, okay, that, that building, even from across the country, I can say, that is my grandfather's house, and it's got this kind of significance, and it's missing this and this and this. I can see from the imagery, now I can actually contribute to something and add to the conversation and add to the planning in the future. I, I think that's important because, um, the, the federal historic preservation compliance uh, process that Deidre described, uh, oftentimes that is, um, it's not particularly transparent to the public. Uh, they don't understand it. 
Uh, frankly, we realized once we arrived in Louisiana after Katrina that there was significant tension, particularly between the city of New Orleans and the preservation community. And it took several months just to describe what that historic preservation compliance process actually meant and what it didn't mean. And I, I think if there, there are ways, uh, obviously there was a diaspora that occurred in Louisiana, particularly from New Orleans as a result of Katrina. As the public returned to the city, I think they became much more interested and engaged in the process, but it was, it was difficult there for a while. I, I think so, and I think, you know, even, you know, you can get on Google Earth right now and look and take a look at the Lower Ninth Ward, you know, now, and you can use that time slider to go back in time and you can watch what happened with, with Katrina and you can watch what happened, what it looks like now, and you can, you can use that information in planning. And I, we were talking yesterday, um, I was, I was going to add this to the, to the paper and I, I just didn't have time. There's a great book out there called Category 5 that describes Camille uh, in 1969 that hit New Orleans, Hurricane Camille, and did exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. It flooded the Lower Ninth Ward exactly the same way, and we learned nothing from that. Now we can take these tools, learn something from them, and, and move forward. Anybody got any questions? Yikes. How about right here? Yes, sir. Hi, hi Susan again. Uh, <laughs> I did want to uh, go back a little bit to thinking about crowdsource mapping and what we might be able to do in cultural heritage with that. Um, in my other life, I'm very involved in, as I said, in human rights and uh, in the a lot of development of geographic technologies in general. And I wanted to highlight open street maps, which I'm not sure that everyone here may be aware of. It's basically an open source version of Google Maps that anyone can edit. So you can go to OpenStreetMaps and set up an account and actually go and add to the base map. So we have all over the country, we have mapping parties where we bring people together and there'll be a location of interest and everybody comes together and sits down and, and maps an area that doesn't have good maps and helps to you know, show where all the buildings are and you know, map out these things so that when something happens, they are more per able to be you know, uh, responding to those types of situations. Um, and so I think that, uh, that that's something that we need to think more about. Uh, there was a Haiti was really the first time that OpenStreetMaps was used in, uh, in humanitarian response. And over the course of, I believe it was two days after the, the earthquake, there were many thousands of volunteers who got online and edited. And they traced across the satellite imagery that was collected and created one of the best maps in the world of a city uh, in such a rapid amount of time. And I think that those types of <coughs> efforts are something that, that we should think about in the future. Well, I think there, uh, there's, there's a, a scary flip side to that for the cultural resource world. Uh, and and we're, doing, we're doing that right now within the Park Service. We're, we're trying to create baseline information uh, through basically the same approach. However, you know, we're collecting, oh, points of interest. That'll be great. That'll be super easy for anyone to figure out. And we'll be able to get points of interest throughout the Park Service. Well, what if, what if somebody says that petroglyph is a great point of interest? I think that's awesome. The public would love to see that. Oh, wait, it's restricted. So there's a, a, a very serious security concern with crowdsourced data. That's why I say it's a little scary for cultural resource folks. But I do think controlled crowdsourcing, what I call controlled crowdsourcing, where it's vetted and things like that, that's something that should be taken advantage of. I just wanted to add to what Susan said. Uh, uh, I didn't have the time to say that yesterday. When we were in Haiti, we, uh, it was very casual conversation. In the same hotel where we, I was staying, there was a guy from IOA, I, IOM, the in Institute International Organization of Migration. And we were talking about, like, we didn't know where are the voodoo temples, what voodoo temples, what voodoo temples. For six months, we were going around 
crazy in uh, Li looking for a list of voodoo temples. And he said, well, I have all the voodoo temples on the open street map. And we invited him to our class, had it, you know, they showed us the map. Sometimes the information is right there and the humanitarians are collecting. And the same experience I had then in Nepal, we also mounted a crowdsourcing initiative for Nepal to map, uh, you know, the initial damage uh, reports coming from the citizens. And in fact, that helped us to do context analysis and to do a situation overview. So I think uh, we should trust these kind of uh, public, uh, you know, crowdsourced uh, <coughs> initiatives more and try to be a little less worry about, worried about security because in the end, these are the initiatives where if you want local communities to respond, then you have to also trust them and trust their voices. Well, I think, uh, I think disasters are the one case where I think crowds, crowdsourced data, I'm a little bit more willing to deal with crowdsourced data uh, because the disaster response has to happen now and we can't, we can't wait. We, ha we have to use the, the, the data that we have at our disposal. And in some cases, I'd rather, I'd rather have a little bit shady data than no data. When I'm dealing with creating my inventory in, prepare, in preparedness for the next disaster, I don't want to trust that. I want to have good data. Because having no data is better than having bad data in that case. From the collections point of view, these days many archives are using uh, ge uh, geotagging, they're using uh, other kinds of uh, you know, uh, things where this will help you to prioritize yes. your, uh, yesterday we were talking about prioritization. And if you figure in how, what people are liking or what people are tagging, then that helps cultural organizations to prioritize content as well as prioritize uh, you know, properties. So I think this, is, this cannot be a one-way street. It right. has to be a two-way street. Absolute, if we want absolutely. them to help, we will. It helps, it helps to identify the significance. Absolutely. Can I speak now? I was wondering, uh, so you have a, a system of red tape, yellow tape, green tape. But uh, what if some very significant uh, historical building, you know, irreplaceable a building is totally damaged? Do you have a, like a category, it's a, you know, very bad damage, but you have to save kind of condition. Do you s still put the red tape or that yellow tape? Like, like uh, Andrew Jackson's you know, house yes. in the Gulf Coast, you cannot replace that. And so I, I, I believe your question really is going to the heart of what uh, represents historic integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually, FEMA, that is, uh, work very closely with the state of Louisiana, and the same occurred in the state of Mississippi, to uh, better define that in the context of damage from Hurricane Katrina to ensure as much as possible that there were not drawn out debates about when historic integrity actually had been lost as a result of the storm. And keep in mind, um, not to get bogged down in the nuances of historic preservation compliance here, but FEMA's responsibilities are triggered by their actions, basically writing a check. If the storm itself, though, has so uh, catastrophically affected a historic property and it's lost its historic integrity, we no longer have those historic preservation compliance responsibilities. In, in essence, as, as uh, is said, there's no there there. And so it was important for us to document that uh, and ensure that everyone understood where historic significance had actually been lost irretrievably. But for the most part, it was, and I think Deidre again, that slide, it was those buildings that it was questionable. Were they going to be demolished or not? And that's where we were actually able to slow down the post-disaster decision-making process, enough so that we could have a thoughtful conversation with all the interested parties around the table and actually signed a legal agreement that committed FEMA and the other parties to certain responsibilities to ensure that we were compensating for the effect of those historic properties that ultimately were demolished. I was wondering, the pre-registration, you know, pre-event, uh, do you have any format uh, for the registration on the historical building? Uh, 
I mean, uh, is that including uh, content, each room content, so? Or? No, no, no just not in terms building. of collections. This is the integrity, the historic integrity of the building yeah. itself, not the contents. Yeah, and that's uh, perhaps one of the Achilles heels of the National Historic Preservation Act, that it focuses on historic properties. It does not focus on larger cultural resources, for example, museum, library, archival collections. There are not the same federal compliance responsibilities for those collections. We did, FEMA that is, did certainly uh, do what it could to respond to the needs of cultural institutions after Katrina, but it was not in a compliance context. Why don't we come down here to this very patient person who's been raising their hand. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's, uh, not to, it's not my question, but uh, I just want to compliment here to the colleague here what uh, you have said about the real-time mobile data. Uh, as we speak right now, you can see uh, this is the 4,000 household uh, which we are collecting in the, which I can show you later. Uh, as I speak, there is around 3,725 household. We have uh, collected the post-disaster uh, impact in the Kathmandu, uh, in Nepal. So in this data, If, if you see it here, like uh, you can see on the right hand side, who took the interview, uh, what the answer was done, uh, and then the, it's all done by the mobile technology. So it's just like the way uh, the presenter say, with whom you are working, uh, how you are working, and where is the coordination. And yes. once you do the coordination in place, then your risk information and your uh, uh, the, uh, the post-disaster recovery as well as uh, bringing the humanitarian uh, sector to the uh, resilience planning sector uh, together. So it's just like not my, it's just to complement the things what we are doing in Nepal right now. You know. That's fabulous. I just wanted to <clears throat> make a quick comment about the crowdsourcing, just to go back to that for a second, because there's enormous potential in that kind of activity. So I work in uh, Iraq and Syria, and in places where access is limited for long periods of time, Geospatial data is really crucial to, to doing anything. At the same time, we're seeing with some new initiatives, I'm thinking of one in particular out of the University of Arizona in Syria and then across the Levant, crowdsourcing to look at archaeological sites and damage. You know, once this was launched, huge security problems, right? Not just the identification and locations of archaeological sites being put out there for anyone to see, but also misidentification. So once they started to bring in these um, crowdsourced people to identify damage, lots and lots of problems with what they were identifying. And I think that's a case where partnerships, as was mentioned before, are really important. Because there's local knowledge that could be integrated into that. But you've got to have, as you said, kind of controlled crowdsourcing. So what they're doing now in this project is they have to go back and start training some of these people to really identify features. And I think it's a much longer term process than people think about when they start to talk about crowdsourcing. But I don't think it's something we can dismiss as a community just offhand. Right, no, I, I completely agree. I don't think crowdsourcing is something that you ever want to dismiss. And like I say, I, I think specifically in the case of disasters, you want to be able to take advantage of it. And again, that, that involves the public and invo it involves the, the communities uh, in such a way that we never could before. It's incredibly important. But to have some way of vetting that data, to eliminate some of those security issues, to eliminate the misinformation that's only going to get perpetuated down the line is critical too. Now, do we have time for one more? OK, we have time for one more. Um, I'm Richard Leventhal from the Penn Cultural Heritage Center. Just want to bring up one thing about access and security because we're talking about as if the flow of information sort of on the vertical level can really work very easily. A lot of communities, both in this country and certainly where I work in, in Central America and other places, communities really at the bottom are not interested and not willing to have the information about their community passed on up to the state level or the federal level within many countries. Uh, they are fearful about the role that the federal government can, can take in coming into these communities, taking land away. And so there's going to need to be a huge amount of conversation with local communities. In some sense, the access of, of information 
tied to those local communities and allowing them, if they're willing, to pass that information up or along other lines to federal or state agencies. I work in Mexico where, in fact, the local community has kicked out the federal government several times. They really will not have them in. And when we take out surveying equipment like GPS equipment, um, they're fearful of even in times of not disaster. If we think about disaster, they're going to be even more worried about federal governments coming in and trying to control what they do and the nature of their activities in their own communities. So just a cautionary note, because I think we, we actually I think to play. We have a great parallel, I think, in terms of the tribal communities here in the United States. Yeah. We, we face exactly the same situation. I know uh, we have, our office in particular, uh, is in dealing, in dealing with tribal communities, faces exactly the same situation, where you'll be talking to a tribal elder who you know, can identify for you all the various different resources that are significant to their origin stories, to, to their subsistence living patterns, to, to their life ways, everything, but they're not even going to write that down on a piece of paper, let alone put it on a map, a digital map, with, you know, that could get anywhere. It is a conversation. It is a conversation that has to be held to, to help them understand not just that we want the data, we don't want the data. We can say, we don't want the data. We want to help you to be able to document it for you in the future. Yeah, I think it's an extremely astute, it's an extremely astute uh, observation and one that uh, I suspect we will be confronting directly in South Carolina in the coming months.